All right, well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I appreciate your time and efforts and, um, and being a part of this process. I just want to scan the uh, panelists and see that everybody is here. I think we do have, um, yep, it looks like everybody's here. So thank you guys for taking the time this morning. Kathy and I, Kathy Wyatt is also going to help <clears throat> with this process this morning uh, because she's uh, my partner in crime and all of this. She's the person who has a lot of information and I rely on too. So, um, so welcome to the Washtenaw County Democratic Party general membership meeting uh, for October. We will be discussing uh, this morning, our discussion is about access to affordable housing and how Washtenaw County uh, is attempting to make that happen. And we have several panelists who are experts and novelists, I mean, experts and knowledgeable about this topic and passionate as well about it. And, um, and so let me just introduce them real quick and then I'll have them say a, a few words and then we'll get started, okay? Uh, so our first guest is Christopher Taylor, mayor of our, our uh, illustrious mayor of Ann Arbor. Thank you for being here. Also, we have uh, Amanda Carlisle, who's from the Washington Housing Alliance, and Teresa <coughs> Galetti. Am I pronouncing your name right, Teresa? Okay. Close, Gelati. Gelati. Okay. Teresa Gelati, and uh, Teresa is with the Office of Communi uh, Community and Economic Development. Um, and uh, did Cedric join us? I'm sorry. I think we don't have Cedric yet. Cedric, are you with us yet? He was going to join us at 1030. And then we also have uh, Desiree Simmons, who is going to, uh, who's representing Ypsilanti Housing Task Force. And Aubrey... Aubrey, you're going to help me here. Patino? Yeah, that's fine. That's the, green, got go, the green go version. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and Audrey, Aubrey is uh, representing um, Avalon Housing. Um, and so we will wait for Judge Simmons. I don't see him here. Um, but um, that was just an introductory of each one of you. So I'm going to start with you, uh, Mayor Taylor if you would just say a few words and we'll um, go down the line. Excellent. Well, uh, I guess thank you all. Uh, thank you for having, uh, having me and, and by extension uh, us at the, uh, at the panel. The affordable housing is an incredibly important uh, uh, initiative uh, in Ann Arbor and, and really throughout Washington County. Uh, you know, as you'll, you'll hear folks tell and you've probably heard uh, already Ann Arbor, uh, you know, in our 2015 study is, uh, determined to be the the eighth most se uh, economically segregated county in the in the country, uh, and uh, you know it's it's getting worse every day, uh, and with with economic segregation, of course, comes uh, comes segregation of, uh, of of all other kinds, uh, and you know frankly that's 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 entirely uh, that's entirely unacceptable, uh, and and so uh, what we need to do in order to address it, uh, uh, at least with respect to Ann Arbor, is, uh, is create uh, more affordable housing, uh, that, uh, and more housing and more affordable housing. Uh, you know, that has been, has been our challenge with respect to Ann Arbor. More people uh, work here, uh, want to live here than, than, than can because of the, the nature of the housing stock. And as a consequence, uh, you'll, you'll forgive me for being joined by one of my friends here. Uh, <laughs> You know, as a consequence, uh, you know, housing is unaffordable. Uh, the affordable housing needs assessment in 2015 identified uh, our, a, a need for 2,800 units of new permanent affordable housing in Ann Arbor by 2035 in order to forestall permanent uh, economic segregation. Uh, we've not gotten very far in that. We have had some successes. I'd, I'd, I'd warrant, you know, tens of millions of dollars. Uh, to uh, make sure that our existing affordable housing uh, with respect to the housing commission that those properties are um, you know recapitalized refurbished uh, and you know energy efficient and you know the types of units that can uh, that make uh, you know Ann Arbor proud and I, and you know the housing commission proud and I hope their residents proud um, 
but going forward, we need more beds for more people. Uh, and that's, you know, you'll probably hear about Proposal C. That's what Proposal C is all about. And I am so grateful uh, to everyone uh, in the Partners for Affordable Housing who, uh, you know, got this, uh, got this party started. Uh, and, you know, it, the Proposal C, uh, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's a one mil millage. It'll raise $6.7 million a year. And, you know, based on, you know, on estimates of looking at just city owned properties, we're looking to be able to support the building with that millage over the course of 20 years of, you know, anywhere between 1,200 and 1,500 units of new permanent affordable housing. And that is, uh, that's for folks with between zero and 60% AMI. And that would just be, uh, that would be an incredible change, an incredible, uh, you know, several leaps forward towards our goal. Uh, and it's something that's desperately necessary if we're going to have the community that, uh, you know, that we want. And so, you know, happy to talk about, uh, about you know, about that in the future, what the, what that housing might look like. Um, but i been also happy uh, and excited to listen to the other panelists who have a lot more subject matter expertise than me. Okay. So I just want to uh, say to honor to um, Judge Cedric, if you could raise your hand because he's an attendee. He came in as an attendee, so we need to make you a panelist. If you could raise your hand, I can go in, in and make you a panelist as opposed to an attendee. Okay. While we're doing that, let me um, let me pass the mantle on to Amanda um, Amanda Carlisle with the Washington Housing Alliance. You want to say a few words? You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> there you go. All right, there we go. Thank you. Um, like Mayor Taylor, I appreciate um, the opportunity to be here today to discuss uh, housing affordability in Washtenaw County. Um, I'm with the Washtenaw Housing Alliance and we are a coalition of nonprofit and government entities that are working to end homelessness in Washtenaw County and we are celebrating our 20th year here um, this year. Um, each year over 5,000 folks experience homelessness in our county um, and many more we know are at risk of homelessness or are um, uh, doubled up and couch surfing and don't have a permanent place and are precariously housed. Um, so our goal is to make homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring or one time. Um, and we are doing a great job, um, our coalition and uh, partners, we're doing a great job of um, um, almost meeting the goals to end homelessness for veteran homelessness. And we really believe that with that as a proof point, we can show that we can end all types of homelessness. Um, and the key factor in being able to do that is really resources and permanent housing. Um, and we have been able to get a lot of resources for veterans through a number of different HUD and VA programs um, to permanently house folks as quickly as possible and get them out of the shelter system. Um, and we believe that the next step is really getting permanent housing for all folks, um, individuals, families, um, across the board in our community. So WHA is a member of the Partners for Affordable Housing. We're really excited about the opportunity that Proposal C presents to us to be able to create up to 1,500 units of new housing, um, especially for folks um, experiencing homelessness or on the lower economic um, uh, stream, but also um, you know, up to folks that are zero to 60% of area median income, which equates to about um, an individual making up to $40,000 a year or a family of four making up to $60,000 a year. So a lot of our essential workers and other folks in our community um, who are working and caring for people in our community but are unable to find housing here. Thank you. Okay. All right. And <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Amanda. All right, let's go to Teresa. If you can unmute yourself and say a few words as well. Thanks again for having me. Good morning. Um, I appreciate Mayor Taylor bringing up that 2015 study. So our office worked on that study with, uh, with Ann Arbor, Pittsfield Township, Ipsy City, Ipsy Township, and the Ann Arbor DDA. And what was really interesting about it in 2015 is it identified two competing markets, right? Ann Arbor, which is a very expensive housing market for both uh, home ownership and rental, but with very high incomes, right? And then on the east side in Ipsy and Ipsy Township, it's lower rental prices, lower sale prices, but also much lower incomes. And so there is a lot of play around that. And really what that does around the economic segregation and sort of enhancing sort of historical racial segregation and those practices that have been placed in the housing market for years. So 
the goals out of it really were to try to balance these two markets, right? So add more affordable units in those higher markets like Ann Arbor and Pittsfield. Um, if in those two communities, we were looking to add 157 units every year for 20 years. To date, we've added 31. Um, although there are, amazing, yeah, but we have 191 units in the queue in the city of Ann Arbor, which is great work and a testament to a lot of the work that Avalon Housing and the Ann Arbor Housing Commission have done. So I do want to honor, uh, it takes a long time. And the city's effort to look at public land and try to look at for that redevelopment could really accelerate us towards that goal. So it's just kind of important to know some of the barriers that hold us back and some options to really kind of push us to that goal. I do want to acknowledge though, the market has changed since 2015 and we are seeing rising housing prices throughout the county. And I'm sure Desiree is going to talk about this even in the city of Ypsilanti, not even in, in the city of Ypsilanti, Ipsy Township, but also Dexter and Chelsea have both set up housing committees also. It's, it's everywhere throughout the county um, that we're seeing these higher rents, higher sale prices, and actually the pandemic has not had that much of an impact on these housing costs. So where we thought maybe early on in the pandemic, should we compare this to the housing crisis? Well, no, because we don't have extra stock in housing. We are still in a shortage of that housing. And so to place um, folks coming out of homelessness, for people who are trying to buy into the market, for people who want to live closer maybe to where they work with Ann Arbor being a job center, it's still hard to get into those markets. Um, but it's hard throughout the county and we're finding with people who have housing vouchers, which are often referred to as Section 8, people are getting priced out of Washtenaw County completely. So I just really want to acknowledge that we have a changing, a changing kind of situation. And the other piece of it that was a bit of a bummer that's happened over the last couple years is that we've lost some affordable units um, to the tune of almost, you know, about a thousand uh, formerly affordable units have come offline. Um, again, due to market pressures for the owners who had those affordable units, they took an option to get out of affordability. So that's also exacerbated our situation. So I don't mean to be all doom and gloom, and especially on the intro, but just wanna kind of really talk about it being a countywide issue, because it really is, and making sure we have that context, but it is important individually that all the different communities are playing a different role. Um, and I know we're gonna hear about at least two today, so I can't wait to hear more, thanks. Awesome. Okay, so just in time, uh, uh, Judge Simpson has joined us, and thank you so much, uh, Judge Simpson. He will be um, covering uh, evictions in Washtenaw County, and so uh, you're just in time to introduce yourself and to say a few words as well. You got to unmute. There you go. There we go. Okay, I'm uh, Judge J. Cedric Simpson of the 14A District Court. Um, we are handling um, eviction cases basically in every jurisdiction outside of Ypsilanti Township and uh, the city of Ann Arbor. Um, basically, as the process has, has started up again, uh, we're starting to get into the CARES Act um, housing, the federal funded uh, housing eviction cases. Um, I'm actually very pleased with how it's proceeding. Um, while there certainly is, and I don't really want to call it a crisis, um, I think we're on the precipice of a crisis. Um, but I think um, with legal services, with the help, assistance of legal services, the assistance of Hawk and the county, we're averting a number of evictions that are that would normally just proceed through in this county um, so I'm hopeful um, I do realize and uh, probably like Teresa I don't want to sound all doom and gloom but ultimately um, come the beginning of the year um, I think we need to take a critical look at um, what is going to transpire and how we're going to deal with some of the issues. There are people out there with a, a lot of money owed. Um, and I think the landlords are willing to work with different programs, but I think we have to be creative and inventive in coming up with different programs in order to save people's housing. So that's my basic introduction. Hopefully not too, too gloomy. 
No, we'll we'll have questions for you though about oh, the gloom. Okay. That, that I can be gloomy on those. Huh? Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, okay, so our next panelist is Desiree Simmons. Desiree, you want to introduce yourself and say a few words as well? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm okay being the gloomy one. It's all right. It's kind of like where I am right now in life. Uh, so, uh, so again, I'm Desiree Simmons. Uh, I wear a couple of hats within the housing spaces. So primarily, uh, so I live in Ypsilanti and I'm part of uh, a subcommittee of the Planning Commission. So we're a subcommittee for housing affordability and accessibility. And we have been uh, working for much past our charter time. Uh, so we've been really deep diving into the housing situation here in Ypsilanti for over two years now. Uh, and so I'm going to share some information. Um, we put out a report which we have presented to the Planning Commission and then um, and we are waiting um, to set a date with the Ypsilanti City Council to do a, have a work session um, so we can share our uh, presentation with them as well as working with other housing advocates in the area. Um, but before I kind of say that, uh, I just wanted to kind of like lift up just like a couple of things that are really important to keep in mind. Um, and, you know, with Ypsilanti in particular, I'm talking about the rising rents um, and the rising cost of homes uh, here. Um, that one of the things that I'm hearing from folks, so I, I actually uh, partly own my home with the bank. So I am not um, as housing insecure as many people that I work with. Um, and, but some of the things I've been hearing just in terms of right now at this moment during a pandemic, as we're talking about, an inc you know, this, you know, potential eviction crisis that we are gonna be facing and that recognizing that a lot of the evictions that happen are happening here in Ypsilanti and Ypsilanti Township. Um, and uh, Ypsilanti as a city is almost 70% renter. So let's, you know, just to keep those numbers in mind. Um, and what I'm hearing is that like, some of these rent increases that people are being um, asked to do uh, as they're looking at doing their leases uh, are, you know, 100 to $200 a month, right? And so we have to recognize that certain increases are evictions, right? Um, because people are not able, are not gonna be able to make those kind of increases. Um, and so some people are then trying to be in positions to, um, you know, to uh, negotiate with their landlords. And we have to recognize that there's a po power differential. And a lot of the things are asking for people who don't really have a, a lot of um, extra time or know-how to understand all the ins and outs of everything, to do all this negotiation with their landlords who have a different power differential. So I think it's important for us to kind of keep that in mind, but recognizing that that is happening here in Ypsilanti. Um, and we do not have, we have about uh, at most like about a 3% vacancy rate. And so we don't have a lot of places for people to go. And since Ypsilanti has been the county's affordable housing plan, um, where do people go after they can't live in Ypsilanti? Um, and also recognizing uh, the other infrastructure that people need, right? Like when there's not public transportation. Also, people were talking about, you know, um, you know, when you are an LGBTQ uh, resident uh, or African American and some of these other kind uh, people who are, have disabilities, um, that there's a lot of different things that there's not many other places to go in this county. And so, what are we do? Like, where do we say people can live after that? Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I have, I mean, I have lots and lots and lots to say about housing, but I'll just leave that there. And then I just want to just say really quickly, just a couple of the things um, that we found within this, uh, our subcommittee. So um, basically, our, the, we did these uh, looking at what the problems are, and none of these are going to be like um, shaking the house. I think we all, we all kind of know these, but what we found, um, and the other thing is for us, when we think about housing here in Ypsilanti, we can't not talk about gentrification and like kind of these processes that we see in these other ways too. So um, the cost of housing is increasing steadily. Um, existing data and measures do not adequately capture the local situation with respect to housing affordability and accessibility. Uh, Ypsilanti's old housing stock poses health, safety, and accessibility challenges. Uh, Ypsilanti does not have much land available to build new housing. 
And our current and past policies contribute to our affordability and accessibility challenges, both at the state and local level. And so maybe later on I can share, we, um, we have proposed 11 different solutions to, um, to these different problems um, uh, that that are both things that can happen within the uh, like the city council can enact um, and then other things that will take more um, more organizing uh, actually really across the state um, and that there's a lot of effort and moving so I look forward to talking about some of those things too thank you awesome all right thank you Desiree okay and for our last but not least um, panelists um, we want to give the floor to Aubrey Aubrey, you want to have a few words? Sure. Good morning. I'm Aubrey. I'm the director of Avalon Housing. So um, we're a supportive housing developer and service provider. Um, we own 292 units. They're scattered over 25 sites. All of those are in Ann Arbor except for one, which is in Chelsea. And we have 144 units in the pipeline, um, two developments in the city of Ann Arbor, and then one um, in Dexter. We're also looking to pursue a 20-unit development in Ypsilanti. Um, in addition to that, you know, we serve folks who are in the private landlord market as well as living in the Ann Arbor Housing Commission. So one of the things that, um, you know, we believe in is that, that we can't develop our way out of this problem um, and full stop, we should not have homelessness in Washtenaw County. Um, it's an absurdity. And, um, uh, you know, Avalon's uh, mission is really aligned to help get people who are experiencing uh, homelessness uh, permanently and sustainably housed with the combination of services and, and permanent affordability that we offer them. Um, with that being said, I guess I'll just highlight that as a community, we have a very sophisticated and really kind of um, sought out uh, system by which we, we look at people who are experiencing homelessness and we identify their needs. And we, and we really systematically um, work not to duplicate services, but to really leverage everything we have to get people into housing. And yet we've held study at um, roughly, you know, anywhere from like 40, 40 to at, at sometimes up to 60, but really more at 40 chronically homeless individuals in our community. Um, and that's a very specific definition. I'll just say quickly, it means that you've had multiple episodes of homelessness and have a disabling condition, or that you've been homeless for a year or more. And recently that number has climbed to 90. So I'm, that's not pandemic related. <laughs> um, we, uh, we can and will need to do better. So despite all of this great work that we're doing, um, we are still operating in the chaos and complacency that allows for homelessness in this community. Um, and um, I'm really excited about what is possible with Propsy. And I want to um, highlight, Mayor Taylor did mention, you know, we can develop 1,500 new units. 375 of those co could be supportive housing because 20% of the revenue can go to services. Um, and that's critical. And I, I think it's, I think that that's going to, that's going to really help us move the needle on, on addressing homelessness, but we have to do something about the larger market and we have to do that countywide. Okay. Thank you, Aubrey. Okay. Um, first off, let me just do a, a, a public service announcement to the uh, attendees that are here and say, if you have questions for uh, any of the panelists, add them into the chat and we'll make sure that uh, your questions are going to be answered, okay? Um, but let me start off with a question. Uh, and thank you again, guys. This is really a hot uh, topic in Washtenaw County. Um, you know, fortunately, I live in an area where, you know, my husband and I have owned, owned our home for 20 some odd years. And, um, uh, you know, in a neighborhood where we're the only per people that look like us. Um, and so, I mean, not fortunate that, 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 that we're the only people that look like us, but it's that, you know, we don't see other people. And it's disheartening to see that there's no other folks, you know, African-American here in Ann Arbor. And we had the fight to get here, for one thing. But um, so my question is, there are several organizations, housing organizations, and, you know, 10 or more, in uh, Washington County, and that, you know, that are working on this project. Why? And I think you mentioned something earlier, Teresa, about the, you know, the hurdles. Why is this such still? Why is this still such a problem that we, can, you know, these organizations can't get together and solve? And and um, 
uh, Mayor Taylor, I want you to uh, address the issue of U of M. I read the article about um, U of M. I'd like to hear about, and I think others would like to hear about, why isn't U of M being made accountable? So I'm going to pose that question, and you guys could um, answer. How do we? Why is it we have so many organizations that's working on this issue, and we haven't solved it yet? And so we can start with with you, Teresa, since you brought it up. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to throw out some stuff, and I think Desiree has kind of lifted some of these up. There are some tools that are not available to us in Michigan that have been very useful in other places. That is not to say that we shouldn't be uh, surrounding it, but I do want to call them out. For example, in the 2015 study, there's like two pages of recommendations, and unfortunately, I would say probably a third of them we could not do in Michigan. The one that we would love to have our hands on is something called inclusionary zoning. And what it would do is it would allow local jurisdictions to set a standard in their zoning ordinance that, that would say any developments of a certain scale, usually it's like five or more units, whether it's a subdivision with home ownership, whether it's apartments, anything would require that 20% of those units would have to be affordable. The reason why this is helpful is that it applies it across the board so you don't have those challenges of a development coming up before planning commissioner or city council and neighbors coming out and saying, well, we like it. We just don't want it here for various reasons. Maybe some legitimate, maybe some not. But what it does is it sets an expectation across the board. So that's not something we have in play. I know that Senator Irwin was looking at possibly proposing something to the state. I think that's something in progress, but it's a tool that we don't even have in our toolkit. So a couple of things that have happened is Ann Arbor, I think, has done a really nice job of looking at its zoning ordinances and some other incentives. And even within the last year, tweaking them so that there's, they're building it in so they can require some things if it's, if it's voluntary. So if there's a voluntary choice by a developer to have, say, increased height or density in the downtown, then there would be a requirement for affordable housing. If the voluntarily the developer who's using brownfield plan or tax increment financing wants to use that tool then they would have to require affordable housing so that's the way we have to frame it we can't require it or mandate it it has to be through these incentives and so i only bring it up because it's like the easiest thing is harder so then we have to try and shift locally tool by tool review them and update them in various jurisdictions to try and make it available so that's one reason I would say another reason in certain markets is the cost of uh, cost of land is very expensive and the market for it is is tight and Aubrey can probably give you tons of examples. Um, for most affordable housing developers, especially nonprofit partners, uh, it takes a while to get your financing together to build the deal. And so if you're competing with market rate developers, you can get outbid very quickly and not have access to that property. That's one of the reasons that you looking at public land that is controlled by local jurisdiction or county or the state is one of the tools that's available to, to communities to, to build affordable housing. There's also cost, um, which I'll also leave to others. Um, but it, I, and, and I'm trying to think of the other bigger barriers. I think I will also say community pressure. I just want to put that out there. I feel like every single time, maybe once, <laughs> developments come up, there's a lot of community pressure, and there's a lot of reasons why, and we can unpack that you today. Mean pressure and I'd like to, pressure to not to, have affordable. Pressure to not have affordable housing. Yeah, yeah. I heard and about that. The hit, what are they called? The not in my backyard. The exactly, in my backyard. Exactly, and that's a real, real tangible challenge. I'm going to leave that to others to jump in on it, but that's a conversation because we need as many supporters out for each of these cases as those against it. Otherwise, it's really hard for a politician, I think, for an elected official to say, I'm getting all these calls of people with concerns. Um, am I getting calls for people that say it's needed? Not always. And so it's a, it puts them in a very difficult spot. So mm. I'll leave it at that and hand it over to Mayor Taylor. Okay. Mayor Taylor. Sure. Um, well, a couple of points to pick up on. You know, I'd like to, you know, uh, on, on that last point, you know, we do have opportunities uh, for uh, for affordable housing that um, where where you know at least in Ann Arbor uh, you know it, it loses it loses at the council table 
Um, the, uh, the Lockwood development would have put, you know, somewhere, if I recollect correctly, a neighborhood of 40 units of, of permanent senior housing uh, in the pipeline, um, rejected a council, Burton Road, uh, a site which has had, uh, you know, quite a lot of, uh, you know, conversation over the years, a proposal, and these numbers escape me, but, you know, to, to alter the, the uh, to, to alter the mix so as to provide for uh, for additional units, uh, which would have been, uh, as I recollect, also senior and also affordable housing, rejected at the council table. Uh, you know, we were going to, and so there's, you know, there are those sorts of pressures. Sometimes it, uh, these things pass, sometimes they don't. Uh, also, uh, we have had uh, resource problems. Um, and when I say resource problems, I mean not enough money being spent on the, sub on the matter. Uh, you know, we have had not, we have not, this is one of the, the, the beautiful promises of, of, uh, of Proposal C, a dedicated funding stream by law obligated to be used for the purpose. Uh, we haven't had that before. Uh, is that what the millage is for? That's correct. The millage is uh, going to be used, uh, you know, by law because, you know, we're going out to the voters this asking for a tax. Uh, and the ballot language is very specific. It's going to be used uh, for affordable housing, in, uh, you know, of, and with respect to uh, the construction of units, I think the capital improvement of existing units, and up to 20% of millage proceeds for services for residents of affo these affordable housing units. This is not an opportunity for, uh, for council in 20 years to take these millage monies and uh, and shift buckets of money from here to here and use this money for something else. The millage money is going to be used for affordable housing. It's going to be used for services provided to residents of this affordable housing. Full stop. One of the things I read, Mayor Taylor, is that the, um, this millage or, or there is information about um, the affordable housing being in a flood zone. That didn't sit well with me. What is that about? Uh, I don't know exactly what it is that you've read uh, the, the bottom line is, is that, you know, any, uh, any housing that is built anywhere will meet, uh, meet applicable standards. So. Okay. And then what about, what about U of M? There's also been some concern about U of M. Why can't we tackle the issue with U of M? They don't pay any taxes here in, in uh, Ann Arbor and they are the biggest use of land here in Ann Arbor, right? Yeah. That, that, that's, that is a great question. The bottom line is, is that uh, the, the University of Michigan is, um, it's an entity that's created by the state constitution. As a consequence, it is, uh, it's you know, in the governmental hierarchy, it is essentially on par with the legislature, um, far superior to, uh, to the city. The University of Michigan doesn't have to follow our planning uh, guidelines. It doesn't have to follow our zoning. It doesn't follow our sign ordinances. It doesn't follow any rule that we promulgate, period, full stop. It also owns land and has billions of dollars. And so uh, University of Michigan, with respect to its own playground, kind of just does what it wants. Um, you know, they talk to us. Uh, we do collaborate. I don't want to say that, you know, they're, they're out to get us. Not at all. You know, no. we, having the university here uh, is a blessing. And, you know, there isn't uh, a mayor or you know, anybody who thinks carefully about a jurisdiction who, um, who wouldn't cut off their right arm to have the University of Michigan in the backyard. Um, you know, they are, uh, well, they're, they're, they're the engine in the community, period. At the same time, uh, you know, they, they have a mission and their mission is not to create affordable housing uh, in the city of Ann Arbor. Their mission is to be a world-class uh, leader in higher education and research. Um, it's necessary for them to achieve that goal to have Ann Arbor be good uh, to be attractive to people, but it's not their main goal. Uh, right. They have expanded, and I'll be done with this uh, in just a sec. Uh, you know, they've expanded over uh, over the past couple of years, which has, um, you know, which has not been good for the housing market in our community. It has resulted in uh, the market uh, building to uh, to student demand, uh, which you know is isn't uh, isn't optimal for for folks who work in Ann Arbor, uh, and also the university has chosen not to use its own, uh, its own land and its own resources to build additional housing. This is something that I frequently bring up, but it's also something where, uh, where we, we, we have no leverage. Uh, you know, the university will do what the university will do in this context. Wow. Can I just, okay. uh, I just, can I just right. add in here because, um, you know, I think there's like, like a couple of just like quick things, you know, cause within, um, with the university, I mean, I, I, I really think that 
you know, how, how somehow we have to get a strategy around this because they do say that it's not in their, you know, like, why should they care about affordable housing, but they're not even building housing for their students, right? And so, you know, we know that over the past so many years that enrollment you know, that they are enrolling more and more and more students, um, but with no care about where those folks live. And what does that pressure do? And then having to hire more and more staff in order to uh, provide services for those students. So where do those folks go? And, you know, and then they come, you know, to Ipsy, like I'm one of these folks, I came here, got a job at the University of Michigan, um, was earning about $50,000, which is ab above the median here in Ypsilanti. And so Ypsilanti was affordable for me where nowhere else would, would have been affordable for me. Um, and so recognizing that role in that process is something that I think that as a community we need to do. And if it takes, you know, to the mayor's point that it's something that we need to look at the state, then we need to be doing that too. Um, and just to say, you know, some of these different things like the inclusionary zoning, another big thing that we are currently unable to do in the state of Michigan is uh, due to a preemption uh, against uh, rent control, um, which is something that, you know, here in Ypsilanti would make a big difference. And, um, and I think also in Ann Arbor, where you have a few landlords who own a lot of properties who actually set the price, because then all the other renter uh, landlords are setting their prices accordingly to what those large land, um, property owners are setting. And so we here could have one um, landlord who's setting the um, rental prices for all the prices here, right? And so uh, we see that there's actually rent control, but it's in private hands. Um, and also, um, and we, one of the solutions, one of the things that we put forward is that at Ypsilanti, we started, a, we have a housing trust fund, um, but it's not, there is no funding source for it. And so, um, the money that was in there um, has been used and we hope that we will be able to have that re replenished, but we don't have another source of funding. And so one of the things that we're looking to is for the universities to be um, putting some money into this, these funds to help us to be able to provide um, all of the some universities. Of housing. Are you talking all Primarily of the universities or are you talking just U of M? We talked about U of M and EMU. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, and then uh, I think the one thing, you know, in terms of public pressure, I think it is important. And it's not only that there aren't people who come out to say there is a need, it's that there are differences in the positionalities of the people who come out to say that there is a need. And so it's, a po again, a power dynamic in terms of who's used to being listened to and who people do listen to in terms of uh, privilege and power in spaces. And I think it's so important. I mean, this is like a narrative shift, but just as like for all of us that we have to also be thinking about, this is not just about the issue that we have today, that if we say that we will not be building more housing, what we're saying is that we are condemning part of our country to die because the climate change, the climate crisis is not going away. We live in a place of this country where people are going to need to move, period, full stop. You know, that's just, a, that's just 20 years from now, we're gonna be having an inflow of folks. And so if we are not prepared for that, what we're saying is that you can't be here um, and we don't care. And so we need people to like really understand that in a deep way, because it's not about like, does my neighborhood look pretty anymore? It's about, do I care about all of humanity? Exactly, yeah. All right, I wanna give <clears throat> Amanda a chance to have a, um, to talk about this issue too of, uh, I first posed a question about how there are all these organizations and why we, you know, are there are there obstacles in your um, from your perspective that uh, we're that's being faced? And we don't want to talk just about the obstacles, but also too about, you know, what you guys are doing. You're doing some wonderful work. I understand that, but apparently we're not making it work in the way that's going to help people. Like I said, I don't see people in my neighborhood you know, who are, uh, who look like me, and we need that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, one kind of just, you know, thing to talk about uh, around the number of agencies. Um, we have been very strategic in how the agencies work together, okay. um, also what they do. So there may be a lot of nonprofits and agencies that are working on this issue, but oftentimes they are working for a specific population and they have expertise and knowledge for that specific population. So 
example, Safe House is our only DV provider. Ozone House is our youth provider. You know, we have certain agencies that are providing emergency shelter. We have agencies that are providing the access door. Um, and we have agencies that are providing permanent housing. And so they're all doing sort of like individual work, but they're working as a system of care. And okay. we've worked really hard over the last um, 10 years or so to in ensure that there's no duplication of services, that people are funneled, and also that people have options. Um, so oftentimes that's, you know, something where, you know, it might not work out with one agency because of the style of the, you know, the consumer and the style of the provider, they need to have another option to be able to go elsewhere for services and, and get, you know, emergency shelter elsewhere. And so, um, you know, we have this system in place and it might look like there's a lot of organizations, but the reality is um, they're all working together really well in coordination and on specific parts of our system of care because it does take sort of a continuum of options in order to get folks from being homeless to housed or at risk and preventing them from ever you know entering the homeless system of care and then i think the other piece is really around resources i think um, desiree mentioned that Teresa mentioned that aubrey um, you know we don't have enough resources in order to be able to serve everybody who comes to the door so typically emergency shelter in, in times when we don't have um, winter um, expansion, we have oftentimes a six week waiting list for emergency shelter. That's really unacceptable. Emergency shelter is emergency and people need to be able to access that. Um, and we won't be able to be, to have less of a waiting list until we have more housing on the back end so that okay. we can get folks out um, of our shelter and, and make it really so that folks aren't spending much time in shelter. That's not the goal by any means, but we don't have that permanent housing on the back end to be able to get folks out. Um, I had mentioned kind of the veterans specifically because that's kind of a smaller system within our system of care. And because there have been so many resources in place, our average length of time that a veteran, a homeless veteran is experiencing homelessness in our community um, is under 90 days. And that's really incredible work that our agencies have been doing in collaboration to get folks, you know, quickly into um, and out of shelter and into a permanent housing unit, getting maybe some subsidy, helping them increase employment or income opportunities, get the benefits that they need. Um, and so that's a real area of our system where we've been able to tighten everything up, get folks in and out, but it's because those permanent housing resources are on the back end. And so Prepsy, is certainly something, you know, the city of Ann Arbor has had the affordable housing fund, um, I think maybe 20, 30 years and never had, you know, a dedicated, I know since 97, um, maybe even before that, but we've never had a dedicated um, funding stream or revenue stream. And this is really the first opportunity um, with Prop C to be able to have that dedicated funding stream so that we can, you know, build the units that we need. And that's if the millage pass, right? <laughs> Correct. Okay. <laughs> I just right, want so, to add one quick thing, which is that the reason that we're, we've been effective with veterans, in addition to how the system is coordinated, is ultimately because we're doing something to intervene on behalf of veterans that, uh, that uses the market, which is that we're, we're, we're using housing subsidy on market rate units. So I think what just to bring that into this, a lot, we, why have we not been as successful as we are? Because the market is disproportionately unaffordable and it's not meeting the needs of, of everyone across socioeconomic strata. Housing choice vouchers, scaling rent subsidies for people that you can lay onto market rate units is a solution. It's a solution that Avalon has deployed. We're serving at roughly 150 folks in Ipsy, um, predominantly in Ipsy because that's where we can actually afford to use housing choice vouchers. But as noted earlier, that's sort of becoming less and less of an option. So I do just wanna, you know, from a federal kind of advocacy standpoint, that, that is a solution that we need to be advocating for in addition to trying to develop and build because we do just have a supply issue as well, of course. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to, <clears throat> sorry, I'm gonna open it up to some questions. I think Kathy might've been looking over some questions that we have. So we have some panelists, I'm sorry, attendees who have some questions. And Kathy, do you have one that you wanna? Uh, yep. Actually, uh, one of the things I, uh, it's sort of two part and whoever wants to chime in, please do. And maybe multiple people. So too often people think 
of housing just in terms of the, the dwelling itself, having a roof. And they don't think about it in terms of all the other societal issues that are impacted by have, have being housed. Um, so there are two things that I thought maybe people could talk about. Uh, and one is um, how important supportive housing, which is part of this millage, is to issues around mental health and substance use disorder recovery. Uh, you know, that we passed this mental health millage, but without housing, I'd like somebody to talk about how important housing is in those recovery areas. Um, and also uh, another thing that's very important to the whole county, but also Ann Arbor particularly, is um, transportation, jobs, and how that relates to the environment and quality of life in, sit in the city. Uh, so if, um, again, two part question, one around mental health and substance use, second around transportation and employment and how that uh, relates to the environment in uh, the city. So who do you want to start? Whoever wants to start with whatever, whichever one. I'll take a stab at the first one. Thank you, Kathy, for um, bringing that up. I really appreciate it. So, you know, housing is, um, it's one of the most important social determinants of health. It can absolutely serve as a platform for recovery. We as a community operate in what we call housing first, which is, um, you know, this is an evidence-based model where years ago we used to make assumptions about sort of um, behavioral changes people needed to make to prove readiness for housing. <laughs> and, um, and data uh, showed that to be highly ineffective and incredibly stigmatizing. And in fact, what people need to stabilize their lives is a roof over their head and to have basic needs met. So we don't treat housing as a reward for clinical success in our community. We treat it as a basic human right. So everything that we do is to try to get people housed as quickly as possible, as low barrier as possible. And what we find is that in fact, people do stabilize in, in multiple different areas. Um, and as you noted, you know, certainly around recovery, um, but also just physical health related needs. Um, we were part of a large national study of um, high utilizers of emergency health systems who are homeless and had chronic health conditions. We know that during that time, our highest utilizer cost our community $1.2 million before we housed her. And she had three hospitalizations over a period of five years after coming into housing. Um, she cost our system nothing after we got her housed, right? So that's an anecdote. But that anecdote is, is indicative of a, larger, of a larger message, which is that we have to, we have to address housing as a social determinant. Um, and that is only possible when we are providing services and supports to people that are individualized, that are community-based, that are available to them in their homes. Um, and uh, certainly that's what supportive housing looks to do. So it looks to kind of look at each household's needs and bring services to them that, that fits those needs. Um, and, it, and it tends to be very barrier free and often of long duration. So, you know, human beings have needs throughout their lives and permanent supportive housing is built on the notion that many of the folks that we serve will permanently need these supports, not everybody. And we support those who are ready to move on. Um, but it is, but it is, you know, there's a subset of the population who do have long-term needs. So, I'm, you know, I think the healthcare sector has woken up to social determinants, certainly over the last five years. How the, how the healthcare sector is really making, you know, upstream investment in addressing social determinants, you know, the jury's out. Um, but it, it's, it is refreshing that, that there is this, I think, kind of awakening around how critical housing is in that conversation. Um, and certainly we see the evidence of that play out every single day when we keep 95% of the folks that we house housed permanently. So what you're saying I is- I was just- uh, um, what you're saying is that um, ha housing, permanent supportive housing can actually change, save money in the long run for um, our, our communities. And yeah, I and so, you know, yeah. To, to note. Yeah, I think that if you, you know, most of the studies have been pre-post, so 
there's a, there's a lot to say about like what randomized controlled trials show in terms of cost savings. With that being said, 100%, it's way more, it's way less cost effective to have someone sitting in a shelter for a day or to have someone in a jail bed for a day or to be hitting our ER multiple times a month than it is to put them in PSH, 100%, not to mention what that does for their quality of life. Absolutely. And not to, you know, in addition to dignity and everything else. Um, and when we started our, our FUSE initiative as a, as a community, um, you know, within the first year, nine people died that we moved in because we got to them too late. They were very sick. One thing that we've seen is, so we as a community have what's called a by name list. So anybody who is experiencing homelessness, we know who they are, we know where they are, and we know what their needs are. And there's a common assessment tool that's being used where we kind of um, are essentially able to look at like, what is their level of need? We've watched over the years that that level of need has actually gone down. So I'm really proud of that. We as a community have really done some deep work to get the highest need folks into housing and keeping them housed but we're watching the numbers go up. <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, making sure that we continue to deploy this tactic and um, certainly the, the millage is gonna allow us to, I think, you know, make, make a substantive impact in a way that we've not yet been able to. And I, I just was also going to sort of add to that, that I, I handle a criminal docket also. And I will tell you that, and I felt for some 30 years now that you can't work with somebody within our criminal justice system unless they're stable in a number of different regards. Uh, the, the base of that really is their home. Um, it, my probation department has great difficulty uh, monitoring, um, sort of keeping people in place, keeping them in check, offering them services if they don't have this domicile or this residence. Um, that then has, in my mind, and has over time, can have catastrophic effects uh, for people. Because the moment I ask them to do something, and it could be a very simple task, if you don't have this base that you're sort of launching from to have that happen, um, they end up in trouble. They end up not in non-compliance with the court. And you mentioned, you know, the cost of keeping somebody in jail. Well, when they don't comply, they can't comply. Then we're bringing them back. We're, we're doing things. And then when you start talking about behaviors, yes, their behavior changes. They, they in a lot of ways, they're lashing out. But you can't get them in under control, they end up somehow and or another incarcerated again. Then you're trying to get them out. And, but, you know, if, for example, if I want to put somebody out and their behavior is out of control and I want to put them on a tether, if you don't have a home, you don't have a phone line that I can hook that tether to, I can't get you out. Mm. So when you want to talk about the cost, we're caught, we're, we're paying to keep somebody incarcerated who really doesn't need to be incarcerated. And that doesn't even deal with the mental health issue <laughs> um, in terms of it. But, you know, I would agree just for, you know, I don't have to really have a study. I see it every day that people that have mental health issues, um, if they don't have that what I like to call it sort of that comfort zone, that place that they can go to, that place that where everything, well, not everything, but some of the things that they need and they, they have to have in life are there. Um, we just have individuals that quite frankly are out of control through no fault of their own. And so it has a huge impact, not just on sort of part of the system that everybody may see every day, it has a huge impact on our whole sort of judicial and criminal justice system. And I, I won't go into what it does to kids and, and that kind of thing. I mean, because we see that every day. So, you know, ultimately, if for no other reason, that's why we have to provide housing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because I think a lot of things, a lot of the ills of society decrease uh, when people have a stable environment in which they can return from whatever they may be doing that day or may not be doing that day. So. Mm. Um, I think just, yeah, I just wanted to kind of add some things um, here in Ipsy because I, you know, I think 
what folks are saying is so true. Um, you know, I know I'm, my, I myself am a prison industrial complex abolitionist, and that's one of the reasons I am focused in housing because we know that um, when thinking about some of the root causes of of things that housing is such a big one because this is something that people need and if um, and when folks are insecure in this area that they're there are a lot of challenges. And we know, um, you know, I was having a conversation with folks in the sheriff's department as an example and saying that actually um, one of the biggest, uh, one of the hardest things and biggest needs for folks trying to reenter is around housing. One of the reasons that people wind up in the, in the county jail is due to um, uh, being, you know, because they're housed with someone else doing this other thing and they're couched up here and, or, you know, they can't go back to this place because of, you know, that there's a lot of housing issues that are helping to lead people into those spaces. And so very much so um, are there these ties um, that I think is so important. And I know here in Ypsilanti, uh, we, to our non-discrimination ordinance, we added that um, felon, uh, if you have a felony record that that falls within our non-discrimination ordinance. And I know from that one of the big things was around housing. Um, and I know personally, just like talking to folks, you know, talking to uh, a father with this kid and he's just like, you know, it's so hard for me to find a place that's safe for me and my child um, and that I can also get to the bus to. And, you know, he, and, you know, I was meeting him because we we're walking to a bus <laughs> together because we had missed a bus. So we want to have this whole conversation. And he talked about like, even how he was to get to the bus stop where we were supposed to go, um, how he has to jump over, you know, all these things, but that that is what is avail was available to him. Um, and, that it is really hard to find that. And so I think that that's important. And a transportation issue is so important, you know, here in Ypsilanti. So it's great because we do have the buses. And I also will say as a person, so I don't drive. I never learned to drive. I lived in cities before moving here. And so, um, <clears throat> And so uh, I count on the public transportation and it's harder for me to get from one side of Ipsy to the next side of Ipsy than it is for me to get from Ipsy to Ann Arbor. And that's in part because our public transportation is uh, built around, is you know, how it's built to get folks into Ann Arbor and out of Ann Arbor, but not necessarily within their own communities. So I think that's something that we need to think about because then within Ipsy, you have folks having to drive around <laughs> all over all the time too. Um, and if you don't have resources, so like working with folks at Sycamore Meadows as an example, um, where for them to get to a grocery store, it takes over an hour. And if you have I don't know, more than one child or even one, but <laughs> trying to do that, that becomes something that you can't do. So now it cuts off access to other things that you need, right? Um, so anyway, I think it, I think the housing and transportation ties are so important for us to keep in mind too. So, Desiree, <laughs> offline, I want to talk to you about not driving. On another <laughs> note, <laughs> like, on that, <clears throat> Um, so I do want to get to the issue of zoning and uh, Kathy, I know you had, uh, I don't know if you want everybody to answer that question. And if anybody else wants to, um, you know, talk about, you know, answer Kathy's question, go right ahead. But I also want to get to zoning um, because my house, you know, my, my husband and I are empty at nesters. Now we have a four bedroom house and um, we'd love to be able to take, you know, the bottom portion of our house and rent it out to whatever, you know, but zoning is really a peach. So, yeah, go ahead and answer that. Uh, so I, let me just cycle back a little bit on the question of transportation. Um, you know, obviously, you know, when we think about where we can build housing that's affordable, uh, you know, where it's best for us to vet, invest first and, and most, uh, you know, access to transportation is an, is an important part of it. Uh, but in addition, uh, you know, it's also important that we, we let the market do some work. Uh, you know, right now, you know, we have a bunch of, in Ann Arbor, a bunch of transit corridors. We've got Stadium, we've got, you know, South State, uh, you know, Huron, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jackson. Um, Stadium, uh, Washington, none of these, uh, we need, I believe, to have, you know, development, uh, zoning, getting to zoning, zoning that incentivizes, you know, property owners along these corridors to build, uh, you know, mic, you know not, not to build strip malls, uh, but to build mixed use developments, you know, retail is excellent, I love having shops up and down the way, but, um, 
but there needs to be housing there. There needs to be uh, a market solution to incentivize, encourage, and support, um, and not support through taxes, but uh, but you know to to unleash. Uh, the demand of people who want to live in Ann Arbor, who would want to live uh, on transit corridors, who would uh, be able to take uh, public transportation in and out of uh, in and out of Ann Arbor to employment centers. Uh, Transit-oriented development is something that that I've wanted uh, us to do for quite some time. Have zoning uh, zoning districts for it. Uh, city council uh, back uh, in in the spring, uh, you know, uh, rejected a call to this Ann Arbor Planning Commission to bring us. Uh, transit-oriented development districts. Um, I believe that that, um, you know, the, with the coming of a new council, that there's going to be um, a, a re-upped request for that, and I hope swift action. Uh, you know, we, um, you know, we can ourselves, uh, you know, with our partners build affordable units, but, uh, but units that are on, uh, that are, on, you know, on transit corridors will, of their nature, you know, they're not going to be affordable by HUD definitions, but, you know, they're going to be, you know, targeted um, you know, at the, I'm, I'm going to make up numbers, you know, they'll be targeted 60 to 80 to 100% AMI. They're going to be places where people who work in Ann Arbor who are now priced out of Ann Arbor can come and live in Ann Arbor. And that's exactly what we need. Yeah, um, exactly. With respect to zoning, you also raise it, you know, uh, you're kind of touching upon, you know, the use of, uh, of someone's current property for, uh, for rentals. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, right now we uh, in Ann Arbor don't have a lot of uh, freedom for uh, for uh, property owners to create accessory dwelling units. Uh, you know, city council uh, back, I guess, about a year change ago rejected um, an opening up of accessory dwelling units. Opened up, you know, rejected a a, a, a proposal to uh, to expand the zoning districts in which current property owners are able to uh, to, to construct accessory dwelling units. Uh, for you know, for, for renting out um, to you know to family members or otherwise, uh, you know I believe too that this is something that the new council is going to take uh, take a look at and take a quick look at. Uh, you know, it is um, uh, it's you know we're we're, we're leaving uh, we're leaving housing on the table when we when we prevent people from um, from doing doing this sort of thing with their property. That's very true. And the other thing too is, uh, Mayor Taylor, this our city council needs some more people who look like me on the council. Is. We really do, and that's been a, a, a big issue. Um, and I don't. I wonder. I have. I want. I have. This is kind of a question or um, a response to some zoning. So within our recommendations, we had a couple of zoning related um, solutions, which include, you know, lifting restrictions um, to reduce. Uh, reducing restrictions for construction or conversion of multi-unit homes, ADUs, which there's a lot of things around accessory dwelling units. I mean, because they can also be really expensive to put in um, if you have, you know, depending on plumbing and all these different things. So there's a lot of things to them. Um, and then smaller scale homes. But one of the things that we were asked, this is something that was passed down um, to our commission to look at um, from council, which is, uh, increasing the number so within resident r1 i think <laughs> sorry. um uh, increasing the number of unrelated adults that can live with uh within a dwelling um and so uh an ipsy was uh, i think it's like three unrelated adults um and so what we were trying to raise it to is two unrelated persons per bedroom in a within a dwelling um and so that's something that so an Ipsy. So it hasn't okay. happened yet. This is one of the things that we're proposing, okay. uh, a change to uh, the current ordinance um, to, to lift that so that more people who are not related could live within a space. And this is something that people, you know, um, especially millennials and other folks that don't you know, really don't have the economic mobility to be able to purchase homes, even if they want to, that folks might purchase, you know, try to go in together, uh, or like have one person who owns it, and then like kind of, you know, have folks or try to people trying to live cooperatively in unofficial ways. And so, and I don't know if that's an issue in Ann Arbor, whether there's uh, an ordinance that is around how many people can live in that space. Um, and there he is. You know, sure. Yeah, there is an ordinance, and not only that, but when I looked at doing accessory dwelling, we, we're still looking at that, but um, again, my husband and I are, are empty nesters. Our kids are out of, the, out of the house, and in order for us to do this, we'd have to agree to live here forever, 
So I have a buy level where there's four, three bedrooms up and two and a, um, what do you call it? A mother-in-law apartment downstairs. And in order for us to rent that out and rent both sections, if we wanted to leave, we'd have to agree to live here. And we have to have our uh, mortgage changed um, to say that we will, you know, we'll live here. That sounds like slavery to me. I'm really not happy with that. So I'm going to work as hard as I can to help us get that changed. It's really ridiculous. Okay, that's my soapbox. That, that's um, the deed restriction thing that you have to do. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yes, restrictions yeah. in order for us to provide housing. If we want to move and you know go to Atlanta with our oldest daughter and just turn this into rental property, <clears throat> there's so many hoops that we have to to uh, meet in order to make that happen. And it shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be. And that's uh, the next issue I'll be tackling after this election. Okay. Um, uh, they, we do have some questions that, that some people in the chat are uh, posing. Kathy, do you have those? Do you have other questions? You got to unmute. I did actually put one in um, the chat. And uh, I, I think we did not get one a answered about the impact on environment um, in the city when you have all, everyone having to come drive uh, two jobs to into the city and uh, as opposed to having housing much closer. Somebody wants to talk about that. Um, but I also think it would be important to talk about uh, the lack of secure, stable housing uh, on children. Uh, this is a community um, that talks about the importance of children. Uh, and I think it'd be good to talk to really address what happens to children who are, uh, and the negative impacts um, if they are housing insecure? Anybody want to address that? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that adverse childhood experiences, the ACEs study was done, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago now. We know, I mean, to this day, I'll say it's, I think it's the biggest public health issue of our time, trauma. And um, when children experience housing instability, their educational outcomes are impacted, their physical health is impacted. Um, amongst the chronically homeless population in this country, we know that at least 65% of them had child welfare involvement when they were kids. So if we wanna do something about homelessness, let's do something about child welfare system. And I think sort of akin to our earlier conversation, at the end of the day, when all of these systems of care continue to see housing as an afterthought, they will fail. The criminal justice system will fail, the child welfare system will fail, the healthcare system will fail. Like, and so at some point, housing needs to be at the forefront of the intervention. And when I see a reentry program that pours lots of money into case management or therapy, great. But if you took every one of those dollars and poured it into housing, you'd probably be more effective. Um, so, I mean, we, when we house families who are, are coming out of homelessness at Avalon, what I can tell you is that it is a, it is a hard road um, in terms of what that first year typically looks like, particularly in, in terms of educational outcomes and sort of the level of support that they need. But long-term gains are incredible. Like what I have seen, intergenerational impact the way that these kids stabilize, the way that they're able to integrate into the community and do well at school and be healthy and play in nature <laughs> and all of these things, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the greatest gifts of this work. Um, and, uh, and just having, watching parents who've had that kind of hypervigilance taken off of their shoulders, day in and out. Um, we have many, many moms who, um, you know, have lost their kids or have had child welfare involvement in the past. And when they move in with Avalon, that all goes away forever. So it's, it's, a, it's a fairly easy <laughs> solution. Um, and I appreciate you, you uplifting that issue. Honestly, you know, I have to, I mean, just because I'm in Ipsy, I think about, like, I know here, like YCS, um, the number, you know, so they actually kind of like, uh, you know, su do direct support for families who are homeless for their, you know, um, for their students and have been seeing that there's an increase in students that are homeless within YCS, right? And so, and recognizing that YCS is a school district, I mean, I'm, we're not going to get into 
funding of school districts um, and, and, and if the inequities there. But here we have a school system that already is underfunded um, and um, but, and also with a population of folks that are vulnerable in all these different ways and trying to provide supports for them. And so I just want to like lift up that I think that they are, you know, really trying to do that work um, and dealing with increasing homelessness among their students. And then, you know, so when we think about right now, right, where, you know, people are supposed to be remote um, technology needs, right, you know, that they don't, they have to then figure out how to make sure that those students can be serviced um, and how to make sure that the families um, are able to be stable enough, right, to even keep their kids in school. And I know just like from my own personal life growing up, um, and having to move around a lot because of uh, home instability, um, how much I missed in that, right? Uh, and it's great, I get to be a full adult now, but recognizing that uh, it takes a lot of interventions for that to be able to happen. And so I think it's so important to say that. And I just wanted to say another thing to tie like the environment, the uh, zoning environment thing too, is um, when looking at, um, development and thinking about like how many parking spaces they need to have um, and that there's some a lot of folks are trying to change some of that to be able to make um, building some housing uh, easier to do but again if we have better public transportation then that makes it more easy right because then you don't have to have two people in the house having two cars and needing parking spaces for both of those vehicles right um, and that that can be really important. Um, although I would love to say like, if, this, if there is a transit supported zone in Ann Arbor, please let's not make it only a market-based solution. We can't, we have to stop thinking about housing in that way. And we need to think about like, who are the people who can't afford cars and car insurance? They need to be near public transportation. So if there is something like that, um, I know I will definitely be pushing to make sure that we are holding some of that housing for people under 60% AMI, which in Ann Arbor is like, Sixty to eighty thousand dollars, or something like that. So, all right, let's go to Teresa. I know you have something to say, and then after that, I have a question for Brian. There's some. Um, I'm sorry for uh, Judge Simpson. So go ahead, Teresa. Uh, just quickly, I mean, I know Kathy threw out that environment question. We've been dancing around it, but similar to kind of what we're talking about, it, I think that we're talking about all these other things, and we're what's the symptom and what's the problem? For me, sort of the issue around some of the public transit needs and wanting to expand it. That's not the, it's trying to fix the problem, which is housing is not where it's supposed to be. Affordable housing is not where we need it. Ann Arbor is the employment center of our region. University of Michigan, University of Michigan Hospital together have more employees than the next top 20 employers combined. So that incredible draw, the number of people who are commuting in every day to those places, but others. Um, all those traffic trips, I think Kathy was reaching at, is, is where we're putting um, more carbon into the environment. To whatever extent we can get more units in Ann Arbor, I would say more units in general and absolutely more affordable. But I mean, supply is a big problem and we need affordable. It's not, we need both and in this scenario. And that's part of the issue that we're facing. So if we can get that together, we're going to be reducing already all of those traffic trips, the congestion that, you know, when we're not in a pandemic is not something that we enjoy going back and forth in and out of Ann Arbor. And it's going to address a lot of those things just naturally because again, housing is, is more of the challenge here. Um, and then the, some, you know, then we experience it in challenges to the public transportation system, all these health issues that we're talking about, trauma, absolutely. And, um, and all that housing has to be safe and there has to be safe and affordable throughout the county. So that's all for that. Somebody mentioned um, looking at housing as a human right, um, as opposed to looking at it as a, a, um, um, a business proposition. And so, um, I don't know. I mean, that just makes sense, yeah. Okay, so Judge Simpson, somebody uh, posed a question about uh, hearing eviction cases. Can you speak to that there asking, um, they're saying that the CDC has declared uh, declaration to hear and just cancel eviction hearings. What do you say to that? To canceling eviction hearings? Well, yeah. I think that those that are calling for that, first of all, don't understand uh, the courts or at least the judges statutory obligations 
and what the law is. We can't just stop hearing the cases. Um, so they during have, a pandemic, has there been a a moratorium on hearing eviction cases? I'm just looking at this question here. Okay. There, during the well, the way it started out, without sort of backtracking all the way to March, uh, when the courts closed in March, we did not, of course, hear those cases. We were then placed uh, administratively on a process to handle uh, cases in a certain fashion. So the criminal cases and those that were incarcerated took precedence. The moratorium um, on evictions went into place. It was at that point not something that the court was going to then hear eviction cases. There wasn't a way to file the eviction cases. There wasn't a remedy. And so it wasn't until the moratorium got lifted, the state moratorium got lifted, that the cases could then be heard. We began hearing the cases. We, a new process was put into place as to how those cases were heard. Um, I think it unrealistic that courts won't hear eviction cases. But I think it's also important for people to understand that the cases that courts are hearing on eviction cases are both termination cases, which may involve behaviors of individuals. They're not all just non-payment of rent cases. Um, and so there are some people who, or some circumstances, where those cases really have to go for where there's drug use in the communities and, and other things that you've got to, somebody has to deal with them. But the proposals or the statements of people that courts should just stop hearing eviction cases, that's not gonna happen. It's not, legally we can't do that. The ideas that come forth that we should then not issue orders of eviction, again, it is not something the courts can do. You'll have to talk to the those in the political realm, um, particularly on a statewide basis, to have that happen. Um, even putting the pressure on the commissioners or city officials or township officials that they should stop it. They don't have the power to stop it. I don't have the power to stop it as a judge to not do it. I. I took an oath to do my job and I have to have those cases come forth or I have to proceed with those cases. Um, even the idea that the courts, for example, won't issue evic evictions or won't execute on evictions, it, it can't happen that way. Those are, you know, and, and I don't mean this badly, but they're simplistic solutions to um, something and ultimately we're going to have to deal with it. So um, th it, it just won't occur that way. I mean, people may like for that to happen. It just won't. Now, having said that, I think there is also a great misconception that there are evictions occurring all over the county. Yeah, it sounds like that. <laughs> and yeah. who's being evicted? Who are the people that are being evicted? Are these um, you know, law-abiding, uh, you know, working-class folks that are being evicted, or is it, who is it? Well, that's a good question, because, you know, I have since March, I think by our last count, I've only signed about 20 orders of eviction. <laughs> that's it. And my docket is huge. Um, and there's now a process by which somebody is even going to get that order where there's going to be a hearing. So I can make sure that all of the programs that are now in place, an individual has a, an opportunity to take advantage of. Um, very few of those are on non-payment cases. Um, the, okay. the, the evictions that are being signed are on termination cases, which will usually involve some health or safety issue. They will involve some issue of violence or they okay. will involve drug use or something else along those lines. 
So, you know, I think it's important that people understand that um, people may say they think they know what's going on. I'm not clear that they do. Um, the way the courts are set up now where we're doing things virtually, um, anyone who thinks they know what's going on, I think I, I'd invite them to attend any of the three district courts here. You can join us on YouTube. You can see us every, uh, for myself every Friday for okay. 50 district court on Tuesday and for 14B on Wednesday. And you can see how the process actually is, is going. Um, and so, you know, the evictions aren't occurring at least in what I like to call the out county because we're different than the city of Ann Arbor. And I don't mean to say anything bad about the city of Ann Arbor, I grew up there. But we, we operate a little bit differently. And so that includes the city of Ipsy where we're not, you know, the orders aren't coming from the court at a rate that people think that it's actually happening. Um, and we're working, you know, Teresa and I, every other Wednesday are sitting in a 7.30 in the morning meeting and having just a Good for you. Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm kind of awake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and, and, but what we're carving out and what we're doing is, is really looking at solutions to how to deal with some of the issues, particularly around the non, the, all, the, the primary effect of the pandemic, which has been the loss of income and evictions occurring in that fashion. Uh, because that, I think, is really the most immediate um, sort of threat or thing that will happen that will cause a great deal of homelessness. Yeah. And, and the reality is, I think, for the, for, and I'll speak for my colleagues um, on the other two benches. I think we've been very successful in preventing those um, from proceeding by the process that we're engaged in, but also with the help of housing access for Washington County and with the help of legal services. Uh, we've been able to, to identify people, get to people, find funding, provide an opportunity for them to pay a portion of the rent, provide an opportunity for them to now dig themselves out of the hole <laughs> in a way. The only thing we none of us have control over is what our economy is going to do and are these people going to be employed so that they can sustain their housing. Um, and that's going to be the real big question um, ultimately as we sort of proceed down the path. This is my first time hearing that. Are you guys... <laughs> Are you guys making this well known? I mean, do people know about this? How do you, how do you, you said identifying, so that sounds like it's a proactive thing um, as opposed to people coming, you, you having droves of people coming and saying, hey, I need help. Right, well, the, the first thing is that with every, and these are parts of the process that have changed. So there is sort of, I won't call them public service announcements, but there are there are flyers out there in communities alerting people to the the different programs that are available. In addition to that, we with every mailing on every landlord tenant case, there is a, a an additional flyer with additional information and contact information that goes out to every tenant who is going to come before the court. Outside of that then, on their first hearing, and we really are required to, in most cases to have two hearings. On their first hearing, um, there is a two page document that I read that explains why they're there in general. It explains their right to an attorney um, where they can receive legal assistance, and then where they can receive then financial assistance. The first one sort of directing them to legal services of South Central Michigan. The second one regarding financial assistance, for us it directs them either toward the Department of Health and Human Services or toward HAWQ. 
and then the other is direct some in regard to the, at least their rights under what would be the Center for Disease Control moratorium preventing evictions to the end of the year. So that is then read to them okay. even before their case is initially heard. In addition to that, so that people understand really what's also happening in the virtual courtroom, and from my perspective, we are blessed to have this. For myself, I just did my docket yesterday. I have six legal services attorneys in my virtual courtroom. We will put them into a breakout room with tenants so that initial contact can occur right at that first hearing and so that they can get the information and do that. We also have housing access for Washtenaw County available at that time so that the preliminary information regarding the availability of uh, funding or financial assistance can occur right at that point in time. It may require a follow-up appointment, um, but you know that's fine. We're actually getting them, we're getting the information um, it's a much better system just in terms of backing up than even having them call or even when they show up and, you know, if legal services or Hawk were not there, I would say, well, you need to contact them. Well, that's fine. They would leave my courtroom, but then life interferes and they don't get to them. Here, what is happening is we're getting to these individuals. Uh, the information is getting out there and the number of people that, quite frankly, are being served is, from my standpoint, tremendous. So much so that the sort of the, the bad part of that comes out and that is, is that it's, it's, it's a tax on the resources that were initially set. So that it, it is becoming difficult, although they're working on it. It is becoming difficult for Hawk to keep up. Um, and, you know, they're having to, you know, initially started out, they could see somebody, they could see somebody in the courtroom, have an appointment usually within a week. That has now expanded where they're not getting appointments, physical appointments, till much later in for October. We were on October 1st or 2nd, which was yesterday and they got appointments three, three weeks out and they just don't have the slots. But they're expanding their capacity and so hopefully we won't continue in that process. But you know, that's what the courts, the court process is doing that I think people don't understand. Um, and how, at least through the, that process, evictions are actually being prevented. Okay. So. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Kathy. So I had one um, question that's a little bit different. Maybe we'd go to uh, Mayor Taylor or uh, uh, Teresa. Um, so there are, you know, looking in the chat, there have been some concerns about uh, retired folks on a fixed income and how, you know, this uh, might be challenging for them uh, in terms of keeping their houses, the taxes going up. And I was wondering if you could talk about programs. Are there programs in Ann Arbor or through the county to help um, senior citizens, people on um, fixed incomes uh, who are, you know, who the taxes are impacting? Is there, a, is there anything there um, or could there be? I, I know this year the city of Ann Arbor has been even more aggressive with the poverty exemption, marketing and information to tenants. So every local union of government has, they set their own standard on what kind of exemption, what level for the poverty exemption to basically completely exempt property taxes for low income folks. And this sometimes does fall into the category for seniors on fixed income. So I've been really impressed that Ann Arbor has taken the initiative to mail more information out, to get it out more publicly. And I think there's some even talk about reconsidering what the threshold is for that. So that's a little different than assistance. It's actually an exemption, so you, but you do have to apply each year. Um, so it is something that we always need help getting the word out because if you've never, if you've done it, you might think, oh, I need to do it again. But if you 
maybe weren't in this situation last year, but maybe the pandemic puts you into it or something else. Um, some other major life change, you may not know about it. So it's stuff we've, all, we've always need help making sure people are aware that that exists. Yeah, if I recollect, I think that's also included in the, uh, in, the, in the tax bill itself. I think we have reference to the exemption right there. Uh, you raise an interest, you raise, of course, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, there's, it, it, it's a classic tension. I mean, you know, the, uh, with municipal finance, uh, as it is uh, in, uh, in Michigan, you know, they, the legislature has over the decades, you know, had a starve the beast mentality and, you know, municipalities are limited in their ability to raise money. Uh, you know, we would love to have a ticket tax for uh, events in excess of 100,000 people. Uh, and that would, you know, in ordinary years and, and you know, in years future would, could raise a, a healthy amount of money for, for the benefit of the community. We are not authorized to do so. It'd be great if we were able to have a targeted sales tax of some kind for the city of Ann Arbor. Um, it'd be great, but we're unable to do so. Uh, you know, we uh, at the same time have needs that only government can address. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the construction uh, support uh, of, you know, the, the neediest among us is, you know, right in the uh, housing and services for them. That's right in the sweet spot of the only, of only government will do it. And, you know, we can't do it uh, without resources. And the only way that we are able to get resources for the purpose is through, uh, through millages. Um, you know, and sale of land. You know, we strove to have some, you get $5 million for, for the affordable housing fund by the sale of the, li uh, of the library lot. That was uh, defeated uh, by uh, Proposal A activists. Uh, there is some money that comes in to the, um, uh, that comes into affordable housing now because of the 40-40-20 uh, uh, use resolution. But that is, you know, obviously still fought every year, um, although I think the fight will be a little less contentious going forward. But even still, that's uh, a limited amount of money. Uh, you know, the only way that we're going to be able to take me the, the meaningful action that we absolutely need uh, in this area is through increased taxes. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm grateful uh, for the, 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 uh, the, the, you know, the um, reference to the, uh, the poverty exemption, that's obviously something that we take very seriously. We know that affordability is an issue, um, but we also know that, you know, that we're the only ones that are gonna be able to take action here. And the only way to do that is through additional resources. All right. Um, one comment that I cannot resist made, making since this is a political party, it matters who you elect to office. Yes. Elections matter. And exactly. Uh, we need all of us to elect people who, whose values um, reflect our, you know, care, are caring about what happens to our neighbors, yeah. um, both on a local, community, state, uh, and national level. Thank you. What you said. All right. So I can't believe that it's 12 o'clock already. We've been having so much fun. <laughs> a lot of information and uh, a lot of contributions, you guys. Thank you so much uh, for yeah, this. Can I just say one thing really quick before? I see something on the comment page about legal services, and I'm not here to comment for legal services at all, but that they're turning away people who need representation. People need to understand that they're under certain federal restrictions, which may go to Kathy's point. It's important who you elect. Um, and are looking at those policies, but legal services is not turning away anybody. I no. encourage anybody that needs help, if they can fit them within their criteria of who they can represent, they will represent them. And I know that Tish Lee, who is over there running it, won't. The number is 665-6181. Give them a call. They will assist any tenant that needs help. So I, I don't want that out there and, and couldn't let it sit there. People sure. know I, I, I'll speak my mind and I have to, I have to just say something about that. So I'm done. Thanks. So thank you, Judge Simpson. Um, and thank you, Aubrey and Amanda and Teresa and Desiree. Uh, you too, Kathy and uh, Mayor, Mayor Taylor. Uh, you need to know that for the next election, I'm going to be running. So you can have some color on your panel. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, you guys, thank you so much for today. It's been a pleasure to uh, moderate this with um, 
along with Kathy, and to hear all the great ideas and uh, the fact that you guys are working all together to make this happen. And, uh, you know, we're going to solve it soon. Uh, one of the things that I would suggest, and if you need any help, I'll be the first one in line, is go after University of Michigan. <laughs> As a taxpayer, I'm not happy that they're not helping. Okay. Thank you again. Um, we will have this uh, recorded and uh, hopefully you guys will come again and, and watch and, um, and be a part. And just like Kathy said, let's go out and vote and get in a new administration so we can start making some things happen. You bet. All right, guys. Have a great day, Thank everybody. You.